ಸರಶವಸಂಭಾಂ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮರಾಚಾರ್ಯಪರ್ಯಂಧ ವಂದೇ ಗುರುಪರಂಪರ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯನ್ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧಿ ತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಗುಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಟು many students attending these classes online um today happens to be vijaya dashami which is considered to be an especially auspicious time for beginning something any new endeavor and in our case we begin shri krishna's explanation of adhikari beda so it's nice timing it's a very important principle that we've talked about in prior classes but it's much under it it deserves to be more widely recognized i think in the tradition and you'll see why uh when we get into that discussion in brief you know that adhikari bheda is a principle that um there are different people since there are different people with different religious and spiritual needs therefore the teachings of hinduism provide different teachings for different kinds of people it's not one size fits all nor is it lowest common denominator both of which are serious problems that we can find in some other uh religious and spiritual traditions not the case here so to introduce today's uh class we can have the slide please so shri krishna thank you um uh uddhava opened the uh, uh chapter with uh with with his confusion <laughs> he was very confused because at the end of the prior uh chapter shri krishna made a very surprising statement shri krishna had been talking about in response to uh, earlier questions of uddhava they had been discussing the gunas and doshas in this case guna the qualities and dosha here meaning defects of various aspects of life following dharma following you know, what the path of dharma the path of of uh, engagement in karma yoga worldly activities and then now an analysis was going on in terms of what activities are beneficial guna to one spiritual growth and which are not beneficial to one spiritual growth dosha and then shri shri krishna ended that activity with a very surprising observation he said that all things considered hmm you said all things considered we shouldn't divide things up in these categories of beneficial and undesirable or unhelpful because after all an enlightened person is beyond all that beyond guna dosha and just to make that a little bit more obvious often times you you look at a person and see what are their good points and what are their bad points 
Do you think an enlightened person does that? When you meet an enlightened person, they size you up. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh! <laughs> Evaluating your good traits and your, your defective ones. That's not the behavior of an enlightened person. And that's how Sri Krishna concluded the prior chapter after discussing all of these beneficial and not so beneficial aspects of life. Then Sri Krishna basically said that, after all, it's all nature. Why should we, dis why should we discriminate? Why should we discern people? In fact, in the Bhagavad Gita, he made a very bold uh, statement. He says, people behave according to their nature. Prakriti. It's natural. So if somebody shouts at you, natural. Somebody slaps you in the face, natural for that person in that situation. And there's a measure of truth to that, which is what Sri Krishna is, which is what Sri Krishna referred to at the end of the prior uh, chapter. But that led to this confusion. And the confusion, and I. Yeah, we did talk about it at the end of the last class. The confusion is one of Adhikari Beda. And that is, what Sri Krishna was referring to is, for an enlightened person, there, this discernment between helpful and harmful is unnecessary. For an enlightened person. Are you enlightened? If you are, then it's easy. You need not discern between what is helpful and what is harmful because you're already enlightened. And that's what his reference was at the end of the prior chapter. Um, Uddhava apparently didn't, uh, didn't understand. He, he ends by saying, uh, Nagamena apavadaha cha if the if uh, itiha Brahmaha. This, if, if th there is the apavada, if, if we dismiss nigamena, all these scriptural commandments about what you should do, what you shouldn't do, scriptural pronouncements about what is helpful in your spiritual and religious life and what is harmful in your spiritual life, Sri uh, Uddhava complains, if this uh, is all dismissed. Ha! He is crying out in sadness. Oh my gosh, this will lead to Brahmaha confusion. So, Uddhava clearly didn't understand the distinction. Sri Krishna was referring to enlightened people not needing to make this distinction, but for everyone else the distinction is crucial and that leads us to a discussion of Adhikari Beda. Or I should say, it leads Sri Krishna to a discussion of Adhikari Beda, which is what we'll see today. Sri Bhagavanu Vacha, Sri Bhagavanu Vacha, Yogastrayo Maya Prokta, Yogastrayo Maya Prokta, Nrnam Shreyo Vidhitsaya, Nrnam Shreyo Vidhitsaya, Nyanam Karmacha Bhaktischa, Nyanam Karmacha Bhaktischa, No Payon Yosti Kutrachata, No Nyo Kutrachata, Yogaha Trayaha Maya Prokta. Three kinds, trayaha, three kinds of yoga, spiritual practice, maya, prokta, have been described by me, nr, nam, for people, and described by me, why, shreyas viditsaya, because I have a desire for the welfare of all people. Shreyas actually can also refer to moksha. I have a desire that all people should gain liberation, is a valid translation of that, of that statement. And so he says, because I have a desire 
that everyone should gain liberation. Therefore, jnana uh, yoga trayaha maya prokta. Therefore, I have taught three different kinds of yoga. Already you're beginning to see this topic of adhikari bheda. What are these three different, uh, different, different uh, practices? Jnanam, knowledge, which is very much the focus of Advaita Vedanta. Karma here means karma yoga, obviously, and we'll talk more about what is karma. Karma yoga is, actually it needs to be said right now, karma yoga is not merely performing your duties. Get that out of your head. <laughs> karma yoga is a very rich and complicated, not complicated, it's a very rich topic with many layers, many aspects, all of which can be summarized by turning your ordinary activities into spiritual practice. You can do your duties without a spiritual thought in your head. <laughs> Right. You can do your, and the ex example I've given many times, if you do your duties and complain incessantly <laughs> about it, that's karma yoga? God save us. <laughs> okay, you get the point. So it's an attitude. It's another way of looking at it would be bringing a devotional attitude to your day-to-day -day activities. Anyway, this is karma yoga. We've talked about it at length. We'll just talk briefly now. And finally, bhakti devotion, bhakti yoga as a path leading to shreyas, leading to enlightenment, leading to liberation. And then he concludes by saying na upayaha. Anyaha asti kutrachit. Na kutrachit, nowhere is there an anyaha upayaha asti. Anya, other, upaya means. There is no other means for moksha, liberation, other than these three. Of course, these three are fair, seem fairly limited. Jnana, karma yoga, and bhakti yoga. You're thinking, what about meditation? What about prayer? What about puja? Well, we can include all of those other practices in the three, right? Meditation can be included certainly in jnana for the sake of gaining spiritual wisdom. Nididhyasana in particular, Vedanta contemplation, is crucial. Um, certainly part of bhakti, to meditate on Ishwara to meditate on a specific aspect of Ishwara. So meditation can certainly be included in the three. Maybe karma yoga also in some, some way or another. So meditation can be included in the other. Prayer and puja most certainly can be, especially in bhakti. Prayer is bhakti. And um, puja, here's an interesting thing you may not have thought about, and that is if you perform Puja, not for the sake of worshiping Ishvara, but if you perform it because it's your duty to perform it, and you perform it without expecting any result whatsoever. In fact, not even with, not even expecting Ishvara's anugraha, blessings upon you. Then, you're, for you, that puja is a form of Karma yoga. <laughs> you can blur the distinction between all of, all of these three, jnana, karma, and bhakti. We can blur the distinctions and we can include any other spiritual practice in those three. Then, with that brief statement, Sri Krishna introduces this next topic of adhikari bheda, and he makes it very clear here. So what are these three options? And in particular, for whom are they intended? That's the key. We'll see that right here. Nirvinanam jnana yogo Nirvinanam jnana yogo Nyasinamiha karmasu, Nyasinamiha karmasu, Teshva nirvinachit 
Chittanam Teshva Nirvinna Chittanam Karma Yogas to Kaminam Karma Yogas to Kaminam So, each of these three, Jnana, Karma, and Bhakti, are practices meant for different kinds of people. By the way, the, the common statement that's often made, I find it very problematic. The common statement that's made about these three is for intellectual people, jnana yoga, for active extrovert uh, people, karma yoga, and for overly devotional, overly emotional people, uh, bhakti yoga. I find this really oversimplified or to use the American uh, expression, it's dumbed down. <laughs> it's much more subtle than that. Don't, there's a problem we, everyone makes. We, we like things simple and clear, but we end up oversimplifying for the sake of clarity. And the fact is, many things are not so simple, so cut and dried, as people say. And that certainly is true about these three spiritual practices. So Sri Krishna, so he's going to talk about jnana first, and very clearly he does not say that jnana, the, the pursuit of spiritual wisdom, one of the three practices, is for, he does not say that it's for intellectual people for eggheads or nerds, to use some of the <laughs> expressions, then for whom is it meant? He says, jnana yoga is meant for whom? Nirvinanam nyasinam iha karmasu. If for those, it's meant for whom? Nirvinanam. For those who are turned away, in this context, disillusioned is a good translation. For those who are disillusioned, karmasu, towards actions. And what that means, those, we've talked about this in many classes, those who have discovered that chasing after worldly goodies will never lead to complete contentment and perfect peace. You get a little little hit, so to speak, of happiness or pleasure when you achieve something, but no matter what you pursue in life, none of those pursuits will culminate in perfect peace and contentment. When you recognize that, then what changes in your mind? You become nirvana. Literally, I'm just getting the etymology of the word in my mind to look it up in a dictionary here. And the, the etymology, by the way, is dispassion. Um, you, be, you lose your interest. That's a nice translation. You lose your interest in pursuing all of that when you recognize how ephemeral the pleasure is and when you recognize that through the pursuit of jnana, jnana yoga, th through the pursuit of spiritual wisdom, you can gain perfect, lasting contentment. So why bother being distracted by all this stuff? Why not Focus on seeking that jnanam. And that's why he, he gives another adjective about those people. People who are not only disillusioned, but people who are nyasinam. Nyasinam, sannyasinam. <laughs> those people who have renounced those worldly pursuits. Of course, it's it's true that most sannyasis are those who have made that recognition of the insufficiency of worldly, worldly pursuits. But here, it doesn't necessarily refer to the lifestyle of a sannyasi. It can simply mean the attitude. You, you can be a sannyasi in your head and still go to work every, every weekday morning. You can wear these robes 
and be more worldly than anyone else. <laughs> I always find it interesting when you see a picture of some sannyasi wearing his robes and then he has an expensive watch. <laughs> Here, and his and his, Mala has his gold beads covering covering each 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 thing. You'll cost thousands of dollars worth of gold and whatever uh, an expensive watch can cost. So just wearing these robes obviously doesn't necessarily indicate someone who has turned away from worldly pursuits. Contrarywise, going to work on Monday morning doesn't mean that you're not a sannyasi inside. If you go to work in, morning, in the morning, not for the sake of building your career, not for the sake of, of uh, getting the paycheck, but if you go to work because it's your duty, <laughs> it's your responsibility to take care of your family, then you have renounced in your head you have renounced climbing the corporate ladder. You have renounced all the goodies that you can get with your, your big salary. So even going to work on Monday morning doesn't mean you're not a sannyasi in your mind and heart. So this is the first category then. Again, just to, to refer to that earlier point, Sri Krishna does not say that those who that the path of knowledge is for those who are intellectual, he does not say. And one reason he does not say is, you don't have to be a great intellect to understand these teachings of Vedanta. It's not rocket science. It's not like nuclear physics. It's something that can be comprehended. Sometimes people complain, oh, it's so complicated. Maybe because I got the wrong teacher or the wrong book, it can sound, it can seem complicated, absolutely, especially if it's not taught properly. But when taught properly, anyone with normal intelligence can get it. So therefore, it's not a matter of intelligence. It is, however, a matter of the shift of inner orientation when you recognize the futility of worldly pursuits, and you turn your attention towards gaining spiritual wisdom. That's what Sri Krishna says. Though for those people, this, uh, these spiritual teachings called jnanam are intended. Then, what about those? Teshu a nirvinna chetasam. Those people who are a nirvana, whose minds are not dissolutioned, chitta mind. For those whose minds are not dissolutioned, teshu, with those karmas, with worldly pursuits, people who still look out into worldly activity and say, oh, that would be nice, that would be fun, that would be great. <laughs> you look on the uh, internet, you see uh, what would be an example. Look, look at a um, website of, a, of any resort in the world, a vacation resort. My gosh, they make it look, they, their photography is such that they'll make this place look like the most amazing, it's better than Swarga. You go, <laughs> that's what the photographs make it look like. It seems, you know, you go, who cares about going to heaven? I want to go to this, <laughs> this resort. It looks so wonderful. Well, this is, that's normal, right? That's normal. There is a normal desire. The desire for pleasure in life is a normal desire. It only becomes problematic when you seek pleasure without following dharma. Only then. If you seek pleasure following dharma, no problem. Go for it as they say. So Sri Krishna now is addressing those people who enjoy life and want more pleasure out of life, those people who, who have not become disillusioned towards what can be gained in life, those people who are kaminam, who have desires. Again, desire in worldly life is not a problem if it is pursued according to dharma. So Sri Krishna says, 
to uh, karma yoga tu. Tu, for them, on the other hand, to distinguish it from the jnanis in the first part, for them, karma yoga. Karma yoga is, is prescribed. Hmm. I'd like to show you another place where we dumb things down and causes big confusion. Karma yoga means what? What did I write down here before? I, uh, karma yoga means nishkama karma. This is a common definition given. Karma yoga means to act without desire. Nishkama karma. Common definition you've all seen, I bet. You've all seen a definition like this. Karma yoga, karma yoga is to act without desire. Well, if you didn't have desire, why would you act at all? <laughs> Nishkama karma is the result of karma yoga, not the practice of karma yoga. Sri Krishna correctly says here that karma yoga is for whom? He says kaminam, for those who have desire, is the practice of karma yoga. If you don't have desire, you don't need karma yoga, because karma yoga is for the sake of removing this compulsivity of raga dvesha, as we've discussed many times in prior classes. So if you have no desires, why should you practice karma yoga? You don't need to. Karma yoga, Sri Krishna says clearly, kaminam is for those who, who have desire, who have raga dvesha, and the practice of karma yoga culminates in nishkama karma, in freedom from desire. Tell me, can, can you, can you, can, let, let me find the right words here. Is nishkama karma a spiritual practice? What that means is, you, you've heard this, you should, underline that word, you should act without desire. Should, should. You should act without desire. Try. What can you do? You have desires. You, can you tell your desires to go away? You came here this morning for class because of a desire. Suppose I tell you, don't come to class unless you are, unless, well, how should I put it? You shouldn't desire to come to this class. If you do have a desire, oh, this, sound, this shows you how silly this is. If you have a desire to come to this class, don't come. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> the whole point of these teachings is to help you deal with these desires and overcome those desires. This is such a common confusion, and it comes when we dumb things down, when we over... Dumb things, that's a little too harsh. Let me take that back. When we oversimplify things. So, the goal of karma yoga is nishkama karma, to act without being driven by desire, without being driven by raga dvesha. But nishkama karma is not a spiritual practice, it's not something you can do. In the same way, you know, another example of this of this oversimplification, going back up, back to jnana, what we talked about before, um, many people will, will quote Shankaracharya, jnana meva moksha. Moksha, liberation, enlightenment, is jnana meva, it is a result of knowledge alone. Therefore, the person will now oversimplify and say, why do I need to practice karma yoga? Why do I need to practice bhakti? Jnanam eva moksha, all I need is jnanam. Here again, oversimplification, jnanam is enlightenment. It's the result of spiritual practice. It's not something you practice. When, Shri, when 
Shankar said jnanam eva moksha, jnanam in that statement means the immediate direct discovery of your true nature as Satchitananda Atma and the utter identity of that Satchitananda Atma with Brahman, the reality of all there is. That personal discovery is what Shankara means by jnanam. Can you, is that a spiritual practice? Vedanta is a spiritual practice. What we're doing right now is a spiritual practice. Try to practice, I've joked like this before, practice being enlightened. Come on. <laughs> it's silly, right? So it doesn't work that way. So this is another example of oversimplification. Um, just as nishkama karma is the result of karma yoga, in the same way, jnana meva moksha, that knowledge is the result of studying what Sri Krishna is teaching Uddhava. You can't practice being enlightened, you can't practice being free from desire. You reach these, con these, these goals through spiritual practice. So we want to distinguish very clearly, to use our technical terms, sadhana and sadhya. Sadhya is the goal, that which is to be achieved. Enlightenment is to be achieved. Freedom from desire is to be achieved. How do you reach those spiritual goals? Through sadhana. Karma yoga is sadhana. Spiritual study is sadhana. Okay, enough said. Continuing. So we've, we've done now jnana and karma. What comes next is bhakti. Yadrichaya mat katado yadrichaya mat katado nyata shraddhas tu yah puman nyata shraddhas tu yah puman na nirvinno nati sakto na nirvinno nati sakto bhakti yoga sya siddhi daha Bhakti yoga siddhidaha. Notice how Sri Krishna is very methodically saying, for those people who are nirvana, disillusioned with worldly life, jnanam. For those people who are a nirvana, not disillusioned with worldly life, but they have desires. Now look in this for in the. Uh, in the third line, how about na nirvinaha? For someone, in the, in the second line, yaha puman, for a person, for a person who is na nirvinaha, who is not disillusioned, na atisaktaha, nor are they attached, nor do they have desires. So Sri Krishna is, is going through different possibilities. If you are disillusioned with worldly life, Jnanam. If you are not disillusioned with worldly life, but you are driven by karma, driven, driven by desire, then karma yoga. But suppose you don't fit into either one of those categories. Nanirvinaha, one who is not disillusioned, and na atisaktaha, one who doesn't have desires. Uh, they don't want to pursue worldly, worldly pleasure. Simply put, what about them? Yahapuman, for such a person, such a person, he puts it in a nice, nice way here. Such a person who, in the first line, yadrachaya, by accident, just, just somehow or another, matkatadao, that person happens to be That person just happens to, to mat katadao, happens to, and you have to add a word here, listen. That person happens to listen to kata stories, adao, etc., uh, stories, etc., mat about me. 
somebody who just happens to hear these stories about me, and as a result, and here's a crucial word here, as a result, in the second line, jata shraddha, a person who has faith and devotion kindled in their heart. We're talking, and he concludes, this is asya, for su- in the last line, asya bhakti yoga. For such a person, bhakti yoga is intended. Bhakti yoga is intended for someone who happens to be, ex- happens to, you know, be exposed to these teachings about the, the life of Sri Krishna as an avatara, as an incarnation of Lord Vishnu, and as a result of hearing those stories, jata shraddha, that flame of devotion is kindled in the heart. Which means, if there's no flame <laughs> of devotion kindled in the heart, Sri Krishna says, this is not for you. Think about that. Um, I, I'm, t- I'm thinking this may have happened to some of you. There's suppose a great kataka, a great uh, uh, a great saint is coming who teaches on Ramayana or Mahabharata or Bhagavata Purana very often, and somebody who's coming, and you are so excited to go and hear this great saint, and they give these wonderful soul-stirring lectures, and maybe they also sing and play harmonium. And as you've, you've heard, you've been to this setting before, you find it just so wonderful, and you tell your friend or, or your spouse, let's go. And your friend or spouse says, I don't think so. <laughs> it's not for me. Now, Here's the problem. Have you ever become judgmental about that person? Ah, why not? Why don't you want to come? This is wonderful. This is spiritual. It's excellent. It's soul-stirring. And you use all of this language trying to convince the person, and they say, no, it's not for me. Isn't that an expression of adhikari bheda? Yeah? Which means, why twist that person's arm to make them come if they don't have that flame of bhakti kindled in their heart? Now, there's a counter-argument. How do you kindle the flame of bhakti in your heart? Sri Krishna said, <laughs> Yadrichaya Matkata, by happening to hear these stories about me. So there is a slight chance, slight, <laughs> that the person who says, no, nah, it's not for me, there's a slight chance that if you can manage to drag that person <laughs> to, the, uh, to the event, they might come around. Might. For most people, it, it's unlikely, generally, when that flame of devotion is kindled first. For such people is the practice of bhakti. So, and, and he says finally that bhakti yoga siddhidaha. That bhakti yoga is capable of taking you to siddhi. Siddhi means accomplishing the goal. It means moksha liberation, enlightenment. Ultimately, all spiritual practice culminates in the same recognition of truth. Um, this, is, this is one more topic that gets to be, um, that gets oversimplified. Here's the oversimplification. There are many paths up the mountain. In the same way, there are many paths to God, many paths to enlightenment, as many paths as you can imagine. Every person can take their own path. This is the diversity. And there's, of course, truth in that, but it's a little 
oversimplified. And here's how if I'm smiling. And whenever I hear my guru's words, I smile. It's nice. Um, he, he used this exact metaphor, and he added a little twist to it. He says, yeah, there are many paths up the mountain, but on top of the mountain there's a mandir, temple, and the temple has one door facing east. <laughs> you have to go in through that door. And what that metaphor means is that there are many kinds of sadhana which lead you to the threshold of enlightenment. Like a temple has a threshold, a doorway. You have to go in through the door in order to, to, uh, to, to see the deity on the altar. In the same way, there are many spiritual practices which lead you to the threshold, but the ultimate realization takes place, to use the language I used before, when you directly discover your true nature as Satchitananda Atma, that so-called inner divinity, and you simultaneously discover that that inner divinity Atma is non-separate from Brahman, the reality of the universe, that realization is enlightenment. And that is equivalent to walking into the temple and seeing the deity on the altar. So many paths up the mountain, fine, but don't oversimplify it. Those paths are paths of sadhana, practice, preparation, gaining adhikaritvam, being a prepared student. But preparation isn't the same as realization or recognition. So that's why many paths, many kinds of sadhana, but all leading to the same recognition. I'll say that one more time. Many, many kinds of sadhana that culminate in the same recognition of the truth of who you are, the truth of the universe, the truth of Ishvara, which of course is one truth. Okay, let's do one more verse. It's actually nice. It'll be a good place to reach. <coughs> Sri Krishna continues to explain this. Adhikari Bheda, Tavat Karmani, Tavat Karmani Kurvita, Tavat Karmani Kurvita, Nanir Vidyeta Yavata, Nanir Vidyeta Tavata, <coughs> Matkata Shravanadova, Matkata Shravanadova, Shraddha Yavat Najayate, Shraddha Yavat Najayate. Hmm. Make some nice points in this verse. First of all, these three, jnana, karma, and bhakti, are not mutually exclusive, he's going to show. And secondly, he's going to show that nor is it fixed for your lifetime. Once a jnani, always a jnani. Once a karma yogi, always a karma yogi. Once a bhakta, always a... Who said? Is there a rule? Show me the rule that says you can't change your spiritual practice mid-course. Notice I said spiritual practice. Again, the path you can, you're going up the mountainside, and you see another, that path looks pretty interesting. <laughs> Let me try that. Why not? If it works for you, then it's, it's, it's worth trying. And these are the points he makes here in this verse. Two points he makes. First, um, in the second line, yavata na nirvidyeta, until you become disillusioned with worldly activities. So, which means as long as you see value in all these worldly pursuits to gain pleasure through worldly activities, 
So until you get disillusioned, first line, tavat karmani kurvita, then you should continue to pursue them, but with the attitude of karma yoga. You should continue to practice karma yoga. So he's, to, to paraphrase the first half, he says, if you are a karma yogi, go on practicing karma yoga until you reach the goal of karma yoga, which is to overcome desire. Can I say that again? The goal of karma yoga is to overcome raga dvesha, to overcome desire. So when you overcome desire, then you are ready for that path of jnanam that Sri Krishna says. And notice, he is saying you take the path of, or going up, I'm using the wrong metaphor, we're climbing the mountain. So you're climbing the mountain on his path of karma yoga, and it's a, it's a tough path. Of course, every path is up a mountain after all. There's no, no path that's going to be easy. So you're climbing this, this path of karma yoga, and finally you reach the end point of karma yoga, and that is you overcome desire. You're no longer driven by raga dvesha. Then to continue it is unnecessary. You see this other path over here, the path of jnana, and what Sri Krishna says is, shift your path. Continue your path of karma yoga until you gain this perspective that worldly pursuits are insufficient for gaining perfect contentment and peace. So continue those worldly pursuits until you see those limitations. Then you can take to that path of jnanam. So you're not, not that you're fixed in a certain spiritual practice for a lifetime. He gives another example in the second half. Matkata shravanada va, va, or yavat najayate shraddha. Ah. Or, or yavat najayate shraddha. If Shraddha has not yet been kindled, that flame of devotion in your heart has not yet been kindled, matkata shravanadao, by listening to my stories. So someone, you, <laughs> you drag your spouse or your friend <laughs> to that uh, religious discourse, and for your friend or spouse, na jayate shraddha, that <laughs> That flame of devotion didn't get kindled yet. Maybe later, but not yet. Okay, then what? Sri Krishna's point is, it has to tie up to the first half, then you continue the path of karma yoga, or you continue the path of jnana. At some point, however, when that flame of devotion does get kindled, okay, then you can give up that karma yoga path as your main focus. You can give up that jnana path as your main focus and devote yourself to a more devotional path. How refreshingly helpful I think this kind of discussion is. It's the antithesis of what's taught in many, especially in biblical religions, which tend to be much more dogmatic, much more directive. You have to do it this way. This is our way. There's no other way. Notice how Sri Krishna began here by saying there are at least three ways. And each of those three have different aspects and they have overlaps. And so if you take all, all of those factors together, you really, it is quite a funny, funny example. Well, well, this is a weird example. Not weird, it's meaningful. How about this? Doctors have discovered, and this is a fairly recent discovery, just in the last few decades, that a medical treatment that works for one person may not work the same for someone else. Now, that sounds kind of common sense, but notice... 20 years ago, if you had an infection, they'd give you an antibiotic. The same antibiotic that they give to everyone with that particular 
uh, infection, which means there were standard treatments for all people. Not all, but, but generally. There's a standard course of treatment for each illness, regardless of who you happen to be. There's a standard treatment. But now we're coming into an age, I think they call it personalized uh, medicine, where they recognize that our genomes tend to affect how certain treatments work for us. And now they're beginning to tailor treatments. They're, and think, I think in cancer uh, treatment, this is especially true, where certain treatments are genetically tailored to work for you according to your genome. Personalized medicine. Powerful. You, you get the concept of it. It's so powerful. So notice then that medicine as a field is shifting away from the standardized treatment to a more personalized treatment. Isn't that adi, of what we're talking about here? Adhikari Beda. And its absence in other religious traditions is, is like, you know, you, you go to the doctor, you say, doctor, I've, I've got this problem, and he says, here's, take this medication. You know, it, that's very old-fashioned now. So there's an attempt to match the treatment to every person. The treatment will be much more effective in the same way here. And this is... This truly is one of many unique features of the Hindu tradition, is its personalized approach. Just like personalized medicine, we now have personalized religion. You get to choose your Ishta Devata, after all, which form of, of Ishwara you pray to, and personalized spirituality as well, jnana, karma, bhakti. So it's a very sophisticated approach from 3,000 years ago. <laughs> Science is only getting to personalized medicine now in the 20th and 21st century. So it's a very sophisticated approach. I, I hope you can, I know you can appreciate that, that significance. I wanted to share that with you at the end of our class. And it's a good place to stop. We'll see more next week. Um, tomorrow, Sunday, we have our Vedanta class, Shankara's uh, Upadesha Sasri. Brilliant text. Come join us at 10 o'clock for Vedanta class and at 11 o'clock for satsang question and answers. And we'll conclude with our prayers. Om Ganana Han Twa Ganapati Gamavamahe Gavinka Vina Mupamashravastamam Jaishta Rajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Patahana Shrenvan Utebesida Sadanam Om Mahagana Pataye Namaha Ishvaro Guru Ratmeti Murti Bheda Vibhagine Vyoma Vad Vyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Vasudeva Sutham Devam Kamsacha Nura Mardanam Devaki Paramhanandam Krishnam Vande Jagad Gurum Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchidduhka Bhagbavet Asatoma Sadkamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Murityorma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om
Ja, så att, 